Thank you, Jerry. And once again, thank you, New Era Software, for sponsoring the Z Exchange as well as this uh, series of sessions on cryptography. Uh, today, this is the 11th session in November, uh, we're going to talk about database encryption and using the uh, crypto infra infrastructure to protect the data in your IMS and DB2 databases. Let's go to slide two. Now, as I'm sure everybody wants, everyone's aware, uh, I left IBM in April. Um, the last 10 years, I had been supporting the crypto infrastructure on System Z. Now, I've got to point out today that I'm not a DB2 expert. Um, I, if you ask questions that are specific to DB2, I'm probably going to stammer a little bit more than I normally do and uh, may not be able to answer the question. However, you know, over the course of the past couple of years, I did get involved with a lot of customers who were implementing some of these technologies and got to work with them from a crypto perspective. So that's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to look at uh, how the database, uh, the databases, IMS and DB2 specifically, uh, can leverage the crypto uh, technology technology, both the hardware and the software, uh, to encrypt the data within the database and some of the considerations and things you need to be aware of. Let's go to slide three. So we're going to start out by talking about the two basic technologies that are available. There's the DB2 built-in functions, and then there's a uh, separately priced product, the Guardium Infosphere Data Encryption Tool for IMS and DB2. And believe me, I didn't have anything to do with the marketing guys that came up with that long-winded name. So I'm just going to refer to it as the Data Encryption Tool. So we'll talk about how they work, a couple slides on each, and, and how they, the basics of how they work. And then most of the rest of the discussion is basically just going to be some comparisons of uh, the DB2 functions to work this way and use the technology this way, and then the data encryption tool on, to contrast those to uh, the built-in functions. And then there's one slide at the end. I want to talk about a couple other areas where uh, crypto technology participates uh, with your database technology. So let's go to slide four. So how do the DB2 built-in functions work? Um, basically, with the built-in functions, the encryption is under the control of the application. That is, uh, within the application, you're going to decide what fields need to be encrypted. And then you're going to imp uh, modify the application or implement the application to perform that encryption. So it's entirely up to the application what's going to get encrypted. Uh, if you skip down there to the bottom of the screen, there's a couple functions, the encrypt function, the decrypt function. And you pass the arguments of the data that you want to have encrypted. And then a password or a, a phrase that's going to be used to generate the key material. So what's going to happen is that password, password or phrase is going to be run through a hashing algorithm, specifically the MD5 hashing algorithm. And the, the hash that results from that is going to be used as the key in a triple DES encryption operation. So the built-in functions only provide support for triple DES encryption. Uh, they were implemented some years ago when triple DES was the uh, primary focus. Uh, AES was just coming on the scene and the built-in functions were never updated to support AES encryption. Now in addition, the function can provide a password hint value. And the idea here is that, that you can uh, store a string uh, that can be used to prompt the end user uh, to help them remember the, the password that's being used. So one way you could implement this would be um, externalize the, the key generation, the password uh, specification to your end user. So for example, uh, my bank might write an application that when I access the, the application, it might ask me, well, you provide a password that will be used to protect your data and only you will know it. And so, for example, I might provide my wife's name of Deborah as uh, the passphrase that I want to use to, to protect my data. They could then prompt me and say, all right, well, when you can't remember what password you used, what hint would you like us to provide back to you to give you a clue? And so maybe I might fill that in with uh, the wife's name. So sometime later when I come back to access my data, 
the application, you know, would prompt me for the password. I couldn't remember it. Maybe I'd hit a help key or something and it would show me wife's name. And that would remind me that I had used the, the string of Deborah as my passphrase. Now, I'm not sure that that's a wise thing to do um, because if I don't provide a very good pass or a, uh, a hint value, uh, I might never remember what password I used. Um, you know, I might screw up the uppercase and lowercase. It might take me a couple tries. So I don't know that making uh, externalizing that password to an end user is a good idea, but the capability certainly is there. Now, uh, again, what happens uh, with the encrypt function is it's going to take the string that needs to be encrypted and it's going to uh, encrypt it using that hash value as a key. The data, the resulting ciphertext, is going to be bit string, a, a bit string. It's not going to be character data. It's not going to be recognizable data anymore. So what that means is that your database layout is going to have to change. So this string that was originally in the, in the database is now going to be a bit string, and you've got to go change the database def definition to specify that. And in addition, that field is going to get longer. Because if you remember, uh, DES works on eight bytes uh, of data at a time. So this function is expecting the data that you encrypt to be a multiple of eight. So if you're encrypting a, uh, uh, say, a nine-byte string, maybe of a social security number, um, the, the ciphertext value is, is going to have to be 16 bytes to handle the padding going from 8 then to 16 bytes. In addition, so there's some metadata that's stored in the field uh, to, to provide some more information about how the data is encrypted. And that's going to take up another 24 bytes. And then the hint field can be up to 32 additional bytes. So where you had a string that was a 9-byte social security number, uh, that's going to go up to 16 plus the 24 plus 32. That's now going to be a 72-byte field. So there's some application and database changes that have to be implemented uh, if you want to use the built-in functions. Let's go to slide 5. Uh, this is an example of... Um, uh, using the, the uh, built-in functions, this example comes straight out of the Red Book uh, Security Functions of IMS DB210 uh, for ZOS. And what they did here was they created a table up there at the beginning. The, uh, the table is going to contain an employee number, an employee name, the city, and a salary for the employee. But the employee number itself is going to be encrypted uh, to provide some protection for the serial number or the employee number. So that's defined as varcar64 with bit, uh, for bit data because it's going to be a bit field once it's encrypted. Um, jumping down to the middle, there's a set encryption password, and what that'll do is by default it will set up a default value for the password as well as the hint field. Now I have no idea what the relationship of PK and Roddy is, and and why uh, a hint value of Roddy is going to remind somebody that the the password was PK, but that's the example they used in the Red Book. So in that insert statement, they're going to insert the employee number uh, into the table, but that employee number is going to be uh, the result of encrypting the actual employee number. And in this first line or, or first insert statement, that em, uh, employee number is 123456. So that's going to be encrypted by taking the password of PK, P-E-E-K-A-Y, running it through the MD5 hash algorithm, and then enciphering 123456 with using that hash as the key. The same thing will happen in the next line where the encrypt uh, is encrypting the employee number of 123547. So what gets stored in employee number is actually going to be the ciphertext along with the metadata and the hint value associated with that field. So that's kind of how the built-in functions work at a very high level. Let's go to slide 6 and we'll talk about the data encryption tool. Now, the original implementation of the encryption tool, uh, the data encryption tool, supported something called edit procs. Uh, we're going to see in a minute that there's some additional capabilities in version 1.2, but the way the edit proc works is it will encrypt the entire row in a single operation. 
So if you have a, a row of data, uh, you know, with multiple fields in it, that row is itself going to be encrypted. An edit proc is, you can think of that as like an exit that's associated with a table. So there's one edit proc uh, that's available for, for every table. You define this edit proc as part of the data, the table definition. So there's not going to be any application changes required to implement this. It's done within the database. Uh, every time you do an insert or an update to, to put data into the table, or every time you read a record from the table, this edit proc is going to get driven. And this edit proc is going to basically invoke the appropriate ICSF crypto APIs. It will have a hard-coded key label in the edit proc, and that's the key that will be used to encrypt the data. So every row in the table will be encrypted with a single key, whatever key is defined in the edit proc. Now, it's important to realize uh, that indexes, the, the actual database index, the key to the database, is not going to be encrypted in this environment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on. So let's go to slide six. Uh, and this chart kind of provides a, a flow of the process of uh, performing the encryption operation. So if you're going to do, a, um, you've got an application that does an SQL insert or an update to a record, it's going to pass the clear text data over to DB2 and say, I want to put this in the table. When DB2 looks at that table, it's going to realize, oh, there's an edit proc defined here. So there's this exit I've got to drive. And what the edit edit proc is, is going to include is a reference to the key label, uh, the key that's going to be used to encrypt every row in that table. So the edit proc is going to invoke the appropriate APIs. So the work's going to get handed over to ICSF. That, that clear text data is going to be handed to ICSF along with the key label. ICSF will retrieve the, the actual key value from the uh, CKDS from its key store and use that to encrypt the data and pass the ciphertext back, the, the whole ciphertext row, the encrypted row, back to the edit proc. The edit proc will hand that back to DB2 and say, okay, here's the data that you need to put in the uh, in the table, in the database. So that's going to get sent to the buffer pool and then eventually get hardened uh, to DASD as well. And whatever logging is going on, that those log records are also going to be encrypted. When you perform a read operation, it's going to work very similarly. Uh, the, the read operation is going to go retrieve the record out of the table, uh, whether it's from the, the DASD or from the buffer pool. Bring that back in. The edit proc being there, uh, DB2 is going to say, okay, we've got to drive this edit proc. It's going to use the same key label. This time it's going to pass the, the key label and the ciphertext to ICSF. ICSF is going to invoke the appropriate decrypt APIs, going to recover the clear text data, and then eventually pass that back to the calling program uh, that actually in uh, initiated the SQL read. So it's all handled with inside of DB2. There's no application changes. So this is fairly easy to implement this level of encryption. It's fairly easy to turn this on. Your end users aren't even going to know necessarily that this particular table is being encrypted. Let's go to slide eight. So as I mentioned before, with version 1.2 of the, of the uh, data encryption tool product, there were some extensions and there's now support for what are called field procs and UDFs or user defined functions. A field proc works very much like an edit proc, the only difference being it works at the cell level or the column level as opposed to encrypting the whole row. So what you can do is define a, a column in the table that will have a field proc associated with it and every time that row is written and that column is processed, this field proc is going to get driven, and the process is going to be very similar to, to what happened with the edit proc, in that the field proc is going to have the key label specified, uh, 
the field proc is going to invoke the appropriate ICSF APIs, hand the work over to ICSF, let it perform the encrypt or decrypt, and now the data that gets written to the table, uh, the, the column that gets, when it gets written to the table, will itself be encrypted. UDFs are similar. Uh, the, the UDFs are a user-defined function. They give, they give a much more granular control within specific cells. So you may choose uh, to, to encrypt uh, some row cells and not others. Now, UDFs do provide some additional value in the, the view and the trigger capability. And that is, if you have a specific view defined, and only certain people are authorized to use that view, when they invoke the view, if they're appropriately authorized, then the UDF is going to get driven and the, the encryption decryption operation is going to be performed. And for a view, it's going to be the decryption operation. So for those authorized users, the decrypt operation will be performed by the UDF and the clear text will get returned back to the caller. If the caller is not authorized to the view, then that process is not going to happen and they can only see the ciphertext. They're not going to actually see the clear, uh, clear text value. Um, it's not the encryption, decryption is not going to be performed on their behalf. Uh, once again, a UDF doesn't require any application changes. Um, it can be implemented within the database itself when defined to the table. Um, it, it will require some uh, re-encrypting the columns in place, so you know, there's some work that has to be done there, but uh, pretty much no application changes are required, so you don't have to deal with uh, uh, recompiling and, and rebuilding the environment like that. Let's go to slide nine. Now, you do need to be the, aware that there are some restrictions on uh, which algorithms and which key types are supported. So let's focus on IMS down there at the bottom first. Um, when the data encryption tool was originally developed, uh, this was the case for both DB2 and IMS that if you wanted to do clear key encryption, uh, you could only do DES, triple DES. Uh, actually, with DB2, you could do AES as well. But with Secure Key, um, IMS only supports triple DES, DES and triple DES. You cannot use Secure Key AES. Uh, and that was true in DB2 as well. If you wanted to, um, if you were dealing with DB2 and you wanted to do Secure Key encryption, it only supported triple DES. And then when they came out with Protected Key support, uh, IMS and DB2 would only support AES encryption with protected key technology. And, and kind of what happened here, I think, is the guys that were actually developing and implementing this technology really didn't understand crypto when they were going through the process. They didn't really understand all of the ramifications, the performance implications of, of using uh, secure key versus protected key versus clear key. And they didn't really ask the right people how to do it. So that's what got implemented. Now, a couple years ago, we had a couple cases where customers were trying to do secure key AES encryption and it wasn't working. And they were not too happy. Uh, there were some FITS requirements submitted. And uh, DB2 can now support uh, protected key using AES or triple DES, DES, triple DES. And it can support secure key using AES and triple DES because that's where the, uh, the requirement came in. Uh, there wasn't as much of a push on the IMS side, so those were not updated update it, you still have those limitations there. Similarly, when they came out with field procs and UDFs, uh, for whatever reason, they only implemented the protected key AES support. So um, if you want to use a field proc or a UDF, you're going to be limited to AES. That's not necessarily a bad thing. AES is probably where people should be going anyway, uh, although I, I'm still a little bit surprised that uh, uh, IBM hasn't stepped up to making this a little bit more generic. But be aware that those restrictions are there. If, if you're do, dealing with IMS, you, you can only do clear key encryption, DES, triple DES. Protected key, you can only do AES. And secure key, you can only do DES or triple DES. You can't do AES. So let's go to slide 10. 
So let's start talking about some of the comparisons uh, and looking at the two capabilities and, and some of the trade-offs that you're going to have to consider. So first of all, we're going to talk about where the key material comes from. With the data encryption tool, your key must be defined in the CKDS. All right, so uh, the, the edit proc is going to go to turn to ICSF and say, go get this key out of the key store. Now, what happens here is, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it a little bit later on, but when uh, DB2 goes to get that key material, that key may eventually be brought back to the DB2 address space. So if you specify a clear key, that key material is actually going to exist in the DB2 address space. And if somebody can take a dump of the DB2 address space, they could conceivably see your clear key material. Now, if you're using protected key or secure key, and that key material is brought back to the, the DB2 address space, it's no big deal because the secure key is going to be encrypted under the master key. Protected key is going to be encrypted under the wrapping key. Not a big deal. But if you are using clear key, the, your key material will exist in the DB2 address space. The DB2 built-in functions work very differently in that there is no key repository. Again, your key is generated from a password that's probably hard-coded or prompted for uh, in an application somewhere. Um, so if somebody can see, see that source code, they could see the the password, they can run it through the same hash algorithm, the MD5 al algorithm. And in fact, what DB2 is going to do is run it through that MD5 hash algorithm, and it's going to have that key material in the DB2 address space. So once again, if somebody can take a dump of the address space, they could conceivably find that key that's being used with the, um, the built-in functions. Let's go to slide 11. Um, the next topic is, okay, I've, I've got my database encrypted. Uh, I want to change the key value. Uh, the PCI standards say that you should change keys periodically. So what does it take to change your key material, uh, change the key that's used to protect the data? So with the data encryption tool, there's there's actually a couple steps you have to go through. And, and let's go back and, and talk about, you know, loading the data, getting the data encryption tool implemented the first time. So you've got a table that's in the clear today and you want to start encrypting every role. You want to start, you want to define the edit proc. So what you would do is you would go define a key in your CKDS and then you would generate the edit proc that points to that key in the key store then what you would do is unload the table in the clear get it into an unloaded file format install the edit proc and then reload the, the table and as you reload the table you're going to drive that edit proc and encrypt the data as it gets put in put back into the table so if you want to change the key you've got to go kind of through a similar process the first thing you're going to do is unload the table uh, as you go, as you perform the unload, every record is going to get written or read out of the table. The edit proc is going to get driven to create the clear text, and the actual clear text record will be uh, be written to the unload file. At that point, what you can, there's two different ways you can go. You could change your edit proc. You could you could define your new key with a new key label, and then change the edit proc or the field proc to point to that new key and then reload the table and once again you're going to drive the edit proc and it's going to use that new uh, table or new key to encrypt the data alternatively after you do the unload what you could do is go into icsf and change the key value don't change the key label just change the key value once again you drive the uh, the reload again and as every record is read it's going to be re-encrypted but now pointing to the new key value that's defined under the same key label in the key store now there are some considerations there. You see that if you do that, use that second technology, you got to do a DB2 restart. That's to get the, the uh, tables cleared up and pointing to the, the correct key material. 
Um, the bigger issue here is probably, you know, how big is the table that you're unloading? If it's a very, very large table, it might require an extended outage to perform the unload. Uh, you know, rebuilding the uh, edit proc and all is going to be fairly trivial, but then it might take a long time again. You know, if you're talking millions of rows in your table, it might take a long time to reload that uh, table. Uh, we've had some customers that have uh, tables that are fairly large. They cannot suffer any kind of extended outage, and the data encryption tool could be problematic in that kind of environment. Alternatively, the built-in functions are going to work very differently. Again, because there is no key store, there is no, the key's not in the key store, and because the application knows what fields, what columns, what cells are encrypted, to re-encrypt that data is strictly up to the application. The application logic is going to control that. So what that says is you have to have application code that's specifically designed to perform a re-encrypt, to read the current record using the current key, the current password, which, is gener which generates the key, and then it would have to turn around and perform a re-encrypt using a new key value and put the data back in. So be aware that you know, when you make the changes to your application to implement the built-in functions, you probably ought to design into that application the capability to re-encrypt the data so that you can change keys if and when you need to, uh, however often you're going to need to do that. Let's go to slide 12. Um, another big issue that you have to consider is what is the impact of encrypting the data on the database indexes. So let's suppose that uh, you have a table that maybe has social security numbers in it. And in fact, the social security number is the key that the database is using to find the records. So when you use the edit proc capabilities of the data encryption tool, the entire row is going to be encrypted. So all of the data in the row is going to be encrypted, including the social security number. However, the index that is used to reference that row is itself not encrypted. So that means your social security number is going to be in the clear in the index. And if you look at the, the if Depending on how you interpretate, uh, interpret the PCI rules, that may not be acceptable because they kind of say that the uh, social security or well, for PCI, the credit card number must be encrypted wherever it exists in the system. You know, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me uh, from a logic point of view. Uh, you know, if you've got a standalone credit card number, that really doesn't compromise anything. But your auditors are likely going to frown on an implementation that leaves the credit card numbers uh, in the clear. Alternatively, uh, when you use the field proc or when you use the DB2 built-in functions, that index value is itself going to be encrypted. Um, so what's going to happen is as you write the record, you're going to encrypt the data and that ciphertext will also become the, the index that's used to reference the data. Now that could have some implications in terms of your application logic. So if you need to find a particular record, uh, a record, if you need to um, search for a credit card number of one, two, three, four, whatever, probably what you're going to have to do is encrypt that value first and then do the SQL read to find that particular record. Now, that's probably not a big deal. That can probably be handled from a logic perspective. However, if you are looking for a span of records, that could become problematic. Okay, so let's imagine that, that maybe you've got a birthday field uh, in your record that is also an index. And uh, let's, to keep it simple, let's just say that the birthday is the month and day of uh, the person's birth. And you want to find all of the records of uh, people that were born in the month of February. Well, what you're going to have to do is encrypt the value of February 1st. February 2nd, February 3rd, all the way up through February 28th, and then do a scan on the table or a search on the table to find all of the records that meet those 28 values. 
So that has some implications in terms of performance and, and actual logic within the program. So database uh, encrypting the indexes, uh, you know, might provide better security, but it could possibly have a, a serious impact on your application logic and on the performance that you can expect, because it's going to take a whole lot more time to find those birthday records when you've got to look for each of those 28 values through the whole table. So just be aware that, that the encryption of the indexes is an issue that you've got to address with your auditors. Make sure they're on board with the solution that you're going to uh, implement. The edit proc is very easy to implement, but it does have the downside that the uh, indexes are not encrypted. So let's go to slide 13. Um, looking and we're going to compare now what the hardware requirements are for the two solutions. For the data encryption tool, uh, the hardware requirements uh, depend to some extent on what type of key you're using, clear key, secure key, and protected key. So if you're using clear key technology, then, then obviously you've got to have the CPAC-F hardware available. Uh, if you're using secure key technology, you've got to have the Crypto Express card available because that's where secure key encryption is done. And similarly, protected key requires um, secure key hardware as well because a protected key begins life as a secure key. But the other consideration is uh, that the data encryption tool requires your key material to be in the key store, in the ICSF CKDS. That might mean you also have to have a Crypto Express card to use the clear key. Because in the older versions of ICSF, you had to have a Crypto Express card to even initialize a CKDS and create a CKDS. Now, starting with uh, ICSF HCR 7751, IBM did implement support for something called a clear key only CKDS. That is, you could create a CKDS without a Crypto Express card but it could only contain clear keys. It could not could ever contain secure keys or protected keys. And in fact, there was no upgrade vehicle so that if you created a clear key only CKDS, it wasn't easy to change your mind later and come back and change that to a secure key CKDS. So if you implement a clear key only CKDS and you only use clear key, then you only need the CPAC-F to support that environment. But if you ever want to use secure keys and protected keys, or if you initially created your CKDS with a secure key, uh, with a crypto card, you're going to continue to have to have that crypto card, even if you're only going to be doing clear key encryption within the database. Um, protected key also requires at least uh, ICSF HCR 7770 uh, as well as the Crypto Express cards. Uh, HCR 7770 is where the software support to take advantage of the protected key hardware uh, was first implemented. And on slide 14, for the DB2 built-in functions, you really only need to have the CPAC-F hardware available. Uh, the um, the clear key encryption is going to be done uh, actually using the MCA instructions. So the KM and the KMC cipher instruction uh, that actually encrypts the data, they're going to be invoked natively. However, you still have to have ICSF up and running. And uh, this is another area. I don't know why they implement it this way, but when they implemented the built-in function support, they decided to use the MD5 uh, hashing to generate the key material. So the password gets run through MD5. If you remember back to when we talked about the hardware, the CPAC-F hardware only supports SHA hashing. It does not support MD5. ICSF, the APIs, will do MD5 hashing, and that's the way they implemented it. So if you want to use the built-in functions, ICSF must be up and running. You don't have to have a Crypto Express card, but ICSF has to be initialized, so the APIs to do the MD5 hashing are available. And then, uh, as a reminder, uh, the built-in functions only do triple DES encryption, so they don't support AES. Again, it uses the KM and the KMC instruction to do uh, triple DES for you. Let's go to slide 15. 
to turn our attention now, I want to talk a little bit about crypto performance. And this first chart uh, we've seen before uh, when we talked about crypto performance specifically. Uh, these are the same charts that we looked at there. And, and just want to remind you of a couple things and the implications in terms of the database encryption. Uh, remember that uh, that Y axis over there is a logarithmic axis. So uh, what we have on the blue at the top is uh, clear key and the uh, throughput that you can expect expect at various block sizes. Uh, in pink is protected key and then down at the bottom in yellow is secure key. So secure key is still very much slower than both clear key and protected key. And the other important thing to remember here that we already pointed out is that the larger the block size, the more efficient the encryption. You can get a lot more throughput by passing lots of data to the hardware at a, at a time. So the problem is when you're messing with the DB2 or IMS, you're probably not going to be able to pass huge chunks of data. You probably don't have rows that are uh, one meg in length. Uh, probably much more likely to be 64 or 128 or 256 and you know maybe even 1024. But if you stop and think about okay if I implement the edit proc support with the data encryption tool I can encrypt that whole row and in one call to the hardware so I might encrypt uh, you know 128 or 512 bytes but that's going to be one call to the hardware if you encrypt the field proc or the UDFs or the built-in functions where you're working on individual cells you're going to be passing much smaller chunks of data to the card or to the hardware at a time. So for example, you know, if you encrypt the credit card number, it's going to be probably 16 bytes maximum or 19 bytes maximum that are going to get passed to the card. If you have multiple cells in a row, say you've got a credit card number and a name and an address and you want to encrypt all three, if you do it at the cell level, Every time you in, in write that row or read that row, you're going to have to perform three crypto operations, one for each cell. Uh, probably it would be a lot more efficient with the edit proc just to go ahead and pass the whole row and do one call to the hardware and you'll probably get much, much better performance. Uh, anything over two columns, you, you're, you're probably going to get better performance by encrypting the whole row. Um, so, as you're looking at implementing one of these uh, solutions, you are going to have to look at the performance ramifications. You are going to have to look at, you know, maybe do some prototyping to say, what is the impact going to be to the, un the original application when I start encrypting selected cells? And would it be more efficient just to encrypt the whole row? Let's go to slide 16. Uh, the next couple of slides are uh, some real life customer numbers. Now these are a little bit dated from several years ago uh, when uh, the data encryption tool first came out. Uh, a very large customer and, and these have been published at, at Share and, and the customer name has been discussed but I'm not going to go into them here. Um, if you do a little bit of digging uh, and go back and look through the Share archives uh, this was covered in a lot more detail uh, some years ago, but what they did was they were trying to figure out what the, uh, the impact would be to their environment. Again, they were a very, very large DB2 shop, so uh, they had extensive experience. They did quite a bit of analysis. This uh, run was uh, encrypting a table uh, down there at the bottom. There were uh, 2,054 uh, total uh, records that were processed, uh, 2,054 records, I guess, in the table. And they ran a test where they encrypted that data using the edit procs and encrypting the entire row, and they were using secure key technology. And this particular run took them uh, five, uh, almost six minutes, five minutes and 42 seconds of elapsed time and it used up uh, 2.96 CPU seconds of, uh, and 
there's there's two different measures. One is application, and I don't remember which is which. I think the first one is the application on you know that the work that DB2 does on behalf of the application, and then the second line there, the DB2 CPU, is the work that DB2 does uh, to get the work done. And so this job took 2.96 and 0.13 CPU seconds. On the next slide, slide 17. We have the exact same table, the 20,054 uh, rows being processed, but this time it was using clear key technology. And you can see that the elapsed time was significantly better. It was just over a minute, so about 20% uh, of what the secure key was. And the CPU uh, that was used by DB2 and then on behalf of the application was significantly lower than secure key because those KM instructions, those KMC instructions are very fast. So the point is, and, and, and what this showed was that clear key was significantly faster and this customer ended up going entirely with a clear key implementation. The, the tables that they had to encrypt, uh, they were encrypting using uh, clear key technology. On slide 18, another test that this customer ran was to do a database load uh, to evaluate the clear key versus the secure key performance. So they had a table with uh, 200,000 rows and they ran it one time using clear key and a second time using secure key. And once again, the um, uh, clear key was much more efficient. The CPU utilization was about uh, a quarter of what it was with secure key, and the elapsed time was um, over 10 times faster uh, using clear key technology. So uh, the secure key is going to cost you more in terms of both CPU and throughput or uh, response times uh, for the database and, and getting the work done. Let's go to slide 19. Um, this uh, customer also ran a number of other utilities. Now, this example is on the left, you've got encrypted tables. And so that these were tables that were encrypted using clear key technology. And over on the right, you have non-encrypted tables. So this was kind of comparing the, okay, when I wasn't doing encryption, it took me this much time. When I turned on clear key, the best performance I was going to get, what was the impact on elapsed time and CPU time when I started doing this relatively efficient uh, encryption. And in almost all cases, um, the, the time went up. It costs more when you start doing encryption. Now, you'll notice there that the first line, the unload utility, uh, it looks the elapsed time was a minute and 37 seconds when they did encrypted tables, and it was a minute and 42 seconds when they did non-encrypted. So I don't know what caused that anomaly. It's not a big difference, but it really surprises me that encrypted tables were faster than non-encrypted. I think there might be a typo in there or something, but, but this is the data that was published uh, when they ran the test uh, a couple years ago. And, and you'll notice that on that line, it took more CPU time when they did the encrypted tables. Um, so I, I kind of think that maybe they got their numbers transposed there. But for which for all of those util all of the other lines and for the other utilities, uh, the elapsed time when doing encryption and the CPU time when doing encryption was higher than when they were not doing encryption. And so you have to factor that in. Can you handle that additional um, elapsed time and the additional CPU requirements? Um, if you can't, then you have to look at things like, well, how do we change the database maybe to strip out, you know, pull out the, the data that needs to be encrypted, the, the ciphertext that needs to be generated, and minimize that as much as possible. So you only have one version of the ciphertext instead of maybe having the social security number or the credit card spread around in three or four different tables. On slide uh, this is an internal benchmark that IBM ran uh, to compare the to look at the impact of protected key technology. Um, so again, this was performed when uh, protected key first came out. So it was on a, a Z10 with the Crypto Express 3. It was running HCR 7770, and they took a table that was fairly large, 16.4 million rows, and then implemented uh, AES encryption uh, to to compare 
that to protect a key and secure key. So with clear key, when they were actually using the native instructions, it took a minute and 15 CPU seconds. Uh, when they used protected key, that went up by about a factor of four to, to just uh, four minutes or just over four minutes. And they did one run there uh, with check off no and another one with check off yes. And if you remember, those have to do with the uh, rack F uh, turning off the rack F uh, checks for authorized programs. And then with secure key, um, the um, CPU time went up pretty significantly, up over 17 minutes. So again, uh, clear key is fastest. Protected key provides a lot more security without quite the impact of the this, this secure key uh, hardware. Let's go to slide 21. Um, this chart is basically just reiterating what we've been talking about, a side-by-side -side comparison of uh, uh, built-in functions versus uh, the data encryption tool. Uh, one of the things I want to point out here, there's, there's a line there that talks about transaction processing overhead. Um, that's really not just overhead, that's the performance impact of what we're talking about here. So that, that row is, is probably a little bit mislabeled. Um, it's what we've just been talking about on the previous couple slides about the performance and the fact that secure key is going to be more expensive. And if you can pass as much data to the, uh, the crypto hardware as possible, that's going to give you the most inf efficient encryption capability. Um, Let's see, is there anything else I want to, don't think there's anything else I wanted to mention on this page other than, well, just remember ICSF is going to have to be active for both environments. Um, you know, I wish they had defined or uh, set up, configured the DB2 built-in functions to use SHA hashing, then you could get away without ICSF, but that's not the way they chose to implement it. So let's go to slide 22. Um, so when you need to start making a decision about you know which of these tools you're going to use uh, a lot of it is going to come down to politics internal politics and the ownership of the data so if you're in an organization where the database administrators are responsible for the security and the integrity and the recoverability of the data then you maybe are going to lean toward the data encryption tool because the database administrators can implement the data encryption tool without impacting the applications folks. And if they're responsible for the security and integrity of it, that's probably the right place to, to implement the uh, encryption technology. On the other hand, if the lines of business are ultimately responsible for the data, the recoverability, the security, then it might make sense for them to decide, okay, which fields need to be encrypted, which fields need to have that security wrapped around them, and then implement that within the application using the DB2 built-in functions. Uh, the downside is that you know, you're limited to triple DES encryption, uh, and your key material is going to be in that password, which is going to be uh, potentially in the clear somewhere within the environment. So it, it, it's to some extent, a political decision in terms of who owns and is responsible for making sure the data is available, that might be the determining factor. You have to consider the security requirements. You know, if your auditors are saying, hey, that's credit card data, that's PCI data, it's got to be encrypted, that may drive you to, away from the data encryption tool. It might drive you to be uh, to using the field procs. Um, but you're going to have to consider that next line, the performance requirements, because if you start encrypting single fields, uh, that's going to have more of a performance impact than if you're encrypting the whole row. Uh, application and production support, uh, that goes back to the idea of you know, the built-in functions require you to change the application. That's going to be significantly more expensive than implementing at with the data encryption tool and doing it within the DB2 subsystem. Uh, it's a lot easier to turn it on there. You also have to consider some of the utilities that you're running. If you are running um, other vendor products, you need to consider 
can they handle this uh, ciphertext? You know, if they start doing an unload of a uh, or a dump of a table that's encrypted, are they going to be able to handle that? Uh, whatever the utility is doing, is it going to know how to handle that uh, ciphertext? Is it going to find the appropriate indexes? You do have some space considerations as well. Uh, if you remember going way back in history, DB2 uh, a long time ago spent a lot of time uh, working on data compression back when DASD was expensive. They have uh, capabilities built into DB2 to, to compress the data as it's put into the database and save uh, DASD space. Well, if you start doing encryption, suddenly compression doesn't work nearly as well. Um, Compression is designed to find things like repeating strings and, and look for those and compress them down. So if you got a lot of blanks, they may get stored uh, in a shorthand form. When you encrypt the data, you random effectively randomize the data. It's much more of a bit string. It's not going to compress very well. So it's possible, you know, if you've got some really efficient compression going on, it's suddenly not going to be so efficient when you start encrypting that data. And then finally, you got to worry about, you know, do I have the crypto, the secure key hardware? Do I have the Crypto Express cards installed? If you don't, then that's going to limit your choices in terms of what you can implement. So you may have to go out and acquire more hardware. Um, if you've got, you know, two Crypto Express cards and you're going to be encrypting lots of data within your database, you may have to acquire some more cards to support that load. So that's, a, that's another thing you have to consider. Let's go to slide 23. There are a couple other things that I want to make you aware of in terms of uh, protecting your, your database data. Um, within DB2, you can have multiple DB2 databases that actually communicate with each other and, and pass data back and forth. Now, those will take advantage of uh, uh, communications uh, uh, network sessions between the two and you can configure comm servers such that those communication sessions are going to be encrypted they are going to be protected so you want to make sure that they are config that comm server is configured properly so that it knows when, when these communication sessions are established that they should a provide encryption and b use the encryption technology that you've got available in system z so they can should be configured to use triple des or aes so it can use the cpac f hardware uh, not one of the the other algorithms that um, SSL and IPsec make available and in addition if you configure if you do configure it that way uh, if you have zips available uh, then that work can be offloaded to the zips which will save you some additional uh, CPU resources as well now in terms of DASD and tape encryption if if you read some of the manuals and, and some of the references that I've got at the end of the session <clears throat> Um, DB2 has historically felt like uh, DASD encryption was the solution. Uh, they kind of balked at, at supporting encryption, native encryption, and using the crypto hardware because their take was, well, you can just encrypt the DASD and that will protect you. They didn't really understand uh, the, the support, the, the security that DASD encryption provides. Um, if you use the encrypting uh, DASD, uh, the total storage solutions from IBM or even any of the OEM products, uh, your data is protected when it leaves your control. Uh, that is, uh, th with DASD encryption, the, the data is encrypted using a symmetric key. That symmetric key is itself encrypted using a public-private key pair. And so when the uh, device gets pulled out of the environment, if you have to send it back to the manufacturer for repair or when it's retired, once you pull it out of the environment, that public-private key pair is no longer available. That means the symmetric key cannot be decrypted and therefore the symmetric key is not available to, to decrypt the data that's on the, on the device. So it protects you when the, de when the, the device leaves your control. When the device is up and running and spinning in your environment, if you are authorized to read the data set or if you are authorized to read the hardware or directly access the hardware, then by default you are also authorized access to the public-private key pair and therefore you can decrypt the data. So that means 
that your storage administrators or your uh, database administrators, uh, you know, if they have access to, they can use utilities to move data around and do unloads and all and that sort of thing, then they are going to get access to the data. And so your storage administrators who don't need to see the, the clear text data to move it around would buy, would have access to be able to read that clear text data. So DASD encryption is not the end all and be all solution to, to protect your data. It's, it's something you should be doing. It, it, you should be using DASD encryption, the total storage of devices, to protect the data when it leaves your control, but it's not sufficient to, to protect the data at all times. It, it will not protect from that kind of an in, unauthorized uh, insider attack. Uh, tape encryption, uh, we talked about the fact that when you do the unload of the database, uh, you're going to drive the edit proc, so what's going to get unloaded is the clear text data that's in the database. So if you are writing that to tape, then you probably want to be using the encrypting tape drives so that the data will in fact be encrypted on the tape drive, uh, even if it's being unloaded in the clear. Um, log files, um, we talked about the fact that the, with the uh, data encryption tool, uh, the data in the log files is going to be encrypted. Putting it on encrypting tape is going to do double encryption, but there's really not a whole lot of penalty there in terms of um, uh, performance impact. So you should be using DASI and tape encryption, but that should not be the only encryption solution that you use. You really need a layered uh, security environment with the uh, uh, doing the encryption. Let's go to slide 24. Slide 24. Keep in mind, encryption has a cost. If you're not encrypting today, you're going to turn on database encryption. Your CPU usage is going to go up. Your elapsed times are going to go up. Those transactions are going to take a little bit longer. You've got to find the balance that you can live with in terms of the, the trade-off of security, secure key encryption versus clear key encryption, and what the performance requirements of the application are. And then lastly, uh, just be aware that those that key material is going to exist in your address space somewhere, uh, whether you're using the built-in functions uh, or if you're using a clear key with the edit procs, the key material is going to be in that DB2 address space. You want to make sure the procedures are defined well enough so that not just anybody can take a dump of your DB2 address space to see that key material. And slide 25 has some reference material. Uh, that first manual is the user's guide. It talks about implementing and, and how edit procs and field procs work. The red books there are, and the articles as well, those are a little bit dated. So for example, that second red book, SG247959, does not talk about field procs and UDFs because it was written before that technology was uh, implemented. So there's some good information in there, but just be aware that it may not be as current as you would like it to be. So with I am going to stop talking for a while, and Jerry, if you can open up the lines, thanks very much.